I want to talk to you this afternoon about uh, a contentious issue, and I far be it for me to talk about contentious issues. But uh, as usual, wherever there's a, an element of religion or culture involved, an issue becomes controversial when it shouldn't actually otherwise be controversial. I am back in, in Conway Hall today for the first time in a very long time. And I used to speak here a lot. I used to work with, I used to be on the board, the executive board of the National Secular Society, which is based here. And uh, I used to fill rooms here. Uh, we used to fill rooms here. Those were, those were the days. Uh, now the people who I used to speak alongside uh, won't be in the same room as me. Uh, I, could, I could be really sensitive about that. Um, but I take it largely as a compliment because I realise that I th somebody yesterday called me the political equivalent. I'm, the, I'm a political sore thumb. Uh, I've been called the punk rock of politics, which I much prefer. But I, yesterday I was called a political sore thumb, and, and I take that as a compliment because I will continue to say things that others won't no matter how many people won't stay in the same room as me because of it. So today I want to talk about two things, mostly. Halal, halal slash kosher, and experimentation on animals. The halal issue is one that is very close to my heart, and it's one of the reasons I started to speak out the way I do about the religion behind it. Now I started, I'm a child of the 80s, I was born in the 70s, but my childhood was the 80s. And the first political issue I can ever remember being aware of and alert to was animals, the treatment of animals. It was the first political issue I ever cared about. And I was about 12 years old when in the 80s the big uh, animal rights um, protests, including some uh, violent protests, uh, were taking place and animal rights was in the, the news quite a lot. So it's the first issue I ever cared about. And I think that with regard to uh, animal welfare, gay rights and women's rights, three things I've talked about a lot, we are actually going into reverse. As a nation, as a people, we are going backwards. And we're going backwards largely because of the accommodation of religion and of religious sensitivities. And that's the first issue I'll address. Halal. Halal is the ritually slaughtered, uh, ritual slaughter of animals. It literally means permissible. And it, can, it applies to lots of things. The word halal applies to lots of things. It simply means permissible in Islam. But it has become synonymous with meat and with food. And halal certification has become a very contentious issue, and it's not only applied to animal-derived foods, in other words, meat, but to non-meat products as well. It is probably the greatest racket in the food industry imaginable. It is a racket. It is Sharia-supporting, Sharia-promoting, Sharia-endorsing groups who are providing certification for food companies who think that they need this because the halal market has grown uh, and is continuing to grow. It has grown by about 30% in Europe in the last 10 years. So massive food companies are getting in on this and they're certifying everything and anything halal. All the major food, fast food chains, to my knowledge, except McDonald's. I don't know if that's still true, but I do know it was true that McDonald's was not going along with this and was not halal. So there's the huge certification issue. And for Britain has talked about that certification issue and we want a public inquiry into where this money is going. We know where it's going, but we want the public to know where it's going. It is going for the promotion of Sharia and the further domination of Islamic norms in our society. It, halal food is being fed routinely in hospitals, in schools, in sporting venues, across the public sector, even in many private organisations. 
The reason being that it's not economically viable to provide two different kinds of meat, and we know for certain there can be no compromise where Islam is involved because it is a dominating religion. So in multi-faith schools or schools with only a tiny percentage of Muslim pupils, everyone is eating halal whether they like it or not. In NHS hospitals, including the big ones like Guy's and St. Thomas, it's all halal, halal, halal. Your supermarket may not be telling you it's halal. In fact, it isn't telling you it's halal, but much of the meat you are buying in your supermarket is halal. Some conservative MPs, Philip Polamo and Philip Davies, who have been really good on these issues generally, did attempt just to have the meat labelled so that you knew, at least you knew what you were buying. They failed in the House of Commons, they could not get support in the House of Commons just for labelling, just for labelling. They know, I think, that if it was labelled, less, fewer people would buy it. And that's not the idea. The, the Islamic lobby would not like it if fewer people bought it. They were, of course, these Tory MPs, were, of course, described as Islamophobes, oppressors of religious communities. And all they wanted was to put a label on the meat so that you knew what you were buying. Failed. Absolutely zero support. So what is halal? Like kosher, it is unstunned slaughter of animals. It is the slaughter of a fully conscious animal. Now our standards of animal welfare aren't particularly high, but we do, the law does require us to stun animals to unconsciousness prior to slaughter, or at least to insensitivity prior to slaughter. Making the law entirely pointless and ineffective, we provided a religious exemption to this. So in other words, this is, what, this is political trickery at its most, uh, the greatest demonstration of political trickery right there. To ban unstunned slaughter and then provide a religious exemption is about as devious a political stunt as it is possible to be. What they have done is try to convince us that they care about the welfare of the animal, but without upsetting the very people who want to carry out unstunned slaughter in the first place. So it makes no difference. The law is entirely, entirely toothless. It doesn't matter. If you were to see, if you were to see the difference between Western slaughter and halal slaughter, you would know just how horrific this is. On Live Leak, I don't think you can get it on YouTube anymore. On Live Leak, I recommend it if you can stomach it. Key in Western slaughter versus halal slaughter. It will show you, I'll describe it to you. It will show you a cow, a western slaughter, a cow walking into a little uh, container, a little, little cage, I guess, and a bolt of electricity is delivered to the cow's head. The cow drops instantly uh, and is then hauled up it's by the legs and is then slaughtered. It's entirely unconscious when this happens. Then have a look at halal. The animal is fully alert, fully conscious, trapped in a steel surrounding. Its throat is cut by several, several uh, wheels of the knife. The animal is attempting to get away. It is uh, causing as much fuss as you would expect an animal to cause when its throat is being hacked at while it's still awake and conscious. And it dies a couple of minutes after extreme, extreme suffering. This is because the Quran says that animals should not be dead at the time of slaughter. Kosher is similar. The animal is fully conscious while slaughtered. The differences are that kosher is not imposed upon us all. You will not find kosher in schools which don't have Jewish children in them. You will not find kosher in hospitals or sporting venues. Kosher is not 
uh, being pushed. It is not a part of an overriding, a Jewishization of society, if you like. But, but halal is very much a part of the Islamization of society. So some figures. In the UK, 51% of sheep and goats are slaughtered without stunning every year. 30% of poultry and 7% of beef. Now, let me deal with the first myth that halal meat can be stunned. No, it can't. The Halal Food Authority will tell you itself that an animal cannot be stunned to insensitivity. It can only, they will only approve two types of stunning. One of them is, is never used on large animals, it's only used on poultry. And it, is electro, it electrocutes the animal, it doesn't actually render them insensitive at all. It actually adds to their suffering. The other type is a bolt, a bolt of electricity. Again, it only uh, confuses the animal, it does not knock them out. It merely disorientates them. In other words, it adds to the suffering. So we are told, even by the RSPCA, that 80% or so of halal meat is stunned anyway. That's what's meant by that. So the next time you hear that halal meat is stunned anyway, it isn't. It isn't. It's electrocution to disorientation, if it happens at all. The Halal Food Authority, on its own website, will tell you that an animal cannot be stunned to insensitivity. We are being lied to over and over and over again, and that should shock None of you. Now the RSPCA, shame on them. Shame on them. Now I know the RSPCA has recently started saying a few things about unstunned slaughter. They took their time. But they are also perpetuating the lie that halal is, is stunned. It is not. On their website they'll tell us that they must respect religion. Why? Why must they respect religion? Their job is not to respect religion, it's to protect animals from suffering. It's got nothing to do with religion. And yet they are putting religion first. Not second, not considering it, they're putting it first. I don't know what organisation, how can you be an animal welfare organisation and place religion above the welfare of animals? But they do. They are perpetuating the same old lies. The Farm Animal Welfare Council, which was commissioned to look into this issue, called it quite ridiculous. Quite ridiculous. The myths, first of all, that halal is stunned, that's, that's ridiculous, but what they were referring to the other myth, the other lie that we swallow, that the animal doesn't suffer any more under, under religious slaughter than under Western slaughter. The Farm Animal Welfare Council simply said it was quite ridiculous. But think about it for a second. Just think about it for a second. If you absolutely had to die, now I know that some will argue that the animal shouldn't be killed at all, that's another matter. But if you absolutely had to die, what do you think you'd rather? Would you rather instant with a bolt to the head or would you rather go slowly with someone hacking at your neck? Which would you rather? What do we think? would cause the most pain and suffering. Where is the common, once again, the common sense has been completely thrown out the window. And you can see our politicians nodding in a group, yes, yes, we, we, we understand. Animals don't suffer any further when they have their throat hacked out while they're conscious than being knocked out first. The lies are extraordinary, and those lies are there to protect, once again, protect religion, particularly, particularly Islam. Now, I am very, very, very clear about this. This country should set an example. We can't save all animals in the world. We can't solve all the world's problems. And we do need to transform the meat industry overall. No one, no society, no culture in the world can stand head and shoulders above others and say, we treat animals uh, uh, wonderfully, why don't you? We don't. We don't. The entire industry is disgraceful. It is utterly disgraceful. We must end factory farming. I, I, what you said was so interesting to me because you're right. 
It's the whole capitalist, uh, this, this, the, it's, it's the money. And when you said uh, that 10, 10% of people's salary was spent on rent, now it's 60%. Here's your problem right there. People have to buy cheap food because it's all they can afford. It's cheap, it's substandard, it's unhealthy, it's unhealthy for the animals, it's unhealthy for the people. But that's, that's the system we have. Uh, it needs changing. We have, of course, too many people in this country as a starting point. And they all need to be fed, hence the growth of factory farming. And the, uh, the, the reduction in welfare and, and concern for the welfare of the animal because it's cheaper to lock an animal into a steel cage than it is to allow that animal to roam freely. We need to get back to some sort of... We need to bring factory farming to an end. Now, that's not easy either. And it's even difficult for me as a political leader to say to me, we need to bring factory farming to an end, but we do. We must aim in that direction. It is unhealthy for everyone. The hygiene standards are shocking. This is all round, all round darkness, and it must be changed. It really must be changed. We have to ban religious slaughter. We have to ban it outright. It won't be difficult legally because there's an exemption. All we have to do is remove the exemption. The country will support it. And we, the religious lobby, well, you know what, frankly, they'll just have to change. This is what we do. We, 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 we pussyfoot around. We pussyfoot around. Well, it's part of their identity. This is religious oppression. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. If your identity involves torturing sentient creatures to death, then your identity is what needs to change, and you need to stop torturing sentient creatures to death. I honestly believe the majority of the country agrees with me, but they are afraid to say so. But today, I am putting our colours, our flag to the mast. We will start an anti-religious slaughter campaign today, and we will make sure the whole country knows what this is, and we will make sure that the majority, that the majority know that they are being forced to eat something which is beyond cruel, beyond dark, and it's being imposed upon them against their will or knowledge, all to accommodate and appease and bow down to tiny religious minorities. I, for one, am tired of that. And I don't want, I don't think it is right, and it's certainly not democratic, for a majority to be bullied and pushed around by minorities, as is constantly happening. And as for the religious freedom argument, let me make this clear as well. Animals are more important than religion. I can't make it any clearer than that. I really can't make it any clearer than that. If your religion is so, has elements that are so unacceptable in a compassionate society, it's your religion that has to change, not us. And what we have now is a society where we are going backwards. We're losing our compassion. We were only just dragging ourselves into the 21st century and back we go, not just to the 20th century, to the 19th, to the 18th, or to the 14th. The other issue I want to talk about today is experimentation, experiments on animals. And I want the public to be fully aware of this as well. I think a lot of people would support the idea of medical experimentation on animals. <coughs> because they think it brings a great deal of benefit to humans. It doesn't. It brings little, if anything, at all to humans. We are, in most of the experimentation on animals that is done in this country is done by universities, with Oxford University at the top of the list. Over a million animals are experimented on in universities in this country every year. And they are, their results simply cannot be used in most, 
cases. In most cases, it is not transferable at all. In most cases, it is simply done because it is funded. And experiments are carried out on animals, including animals, that are highly, highly intelligent animals like monkeys, for no reason other than to bring funding into universities because they've already answered the question. So they will take a young, a baby monkey away from its mother, for example, raise it entirely in isolation, and then try and figure out if it has any behavioral problems. Well, of course it has behavioral problems. And they're trying to figure out, they do this in the justification, well, if the monkey has behavioral problems, then we can decipher from this that if a child was raised in complete isolation, it might have social problems. We know perfectly well that if a child was raised in isolation, it would have social problems. And yet they are experimenting on hundreds, if not thousands of monkeys to try and prove that a child will have social problems if raised in isolation. They know this. They're doing it for the funding and for the funding only. Experiments include animals being poisoned, cut open, deliberately brain damaged, paralysed, infected with diseases. The number of animals this occurred to last year, 2017 to 2018, was 3,721,774. In the Imperial College, an undercover investigation was carried out in the Imperial College London, which found that animals, including monkeys, were having substances injected directly into their brains. They were forced to run on, uh, what are those running machines called? <laughs> treadmill. Forced to run on a treadmill until collapsing with exhaustion. With uh, electric shocks, if they got tired, they were shocked back into activity until they simply collapsed and even electric shocks wouldn't raise them. Tubes directly inserted into their stomach deliberately left with barns and open wounds to experiment on how quickly and how... We've been here. It's almost that they, they'll set fire to the... To, they will put boiling hot substance on the back of a, of a pig to see if its skin will burn. Well, for crying out loud, we know what skin's going to burn. Then they leave it to see how quickly it will heal. This is done to thousands upon thousands of animals for no good reason. Other things found in the Imperial College were live beheading, the breaking of necks, carbon dioxide poisoning. And the worst five universities for these kinds of experiments on animals are Oxford, Edinburgh, UCL, KCL and Cambridge. They experiment on monkeys, rabbits, guinea pigs, ferrets, fish, birds, frogs, rats and mice. One experiment had monkeys deprived of food and water, electrodes placed into their skulls, and they were trapped inside plastic boxes while loud music was blasted at them to, respond, to measure their response to that kind of strain. This is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. I feel sick just reading this out. These animals cry out in pain. We know they shed tears. We know they have affection for each other. We know they have affection for us. We know that animals are sentient, feeling creatures. And we know that we have in our power to show compassion or not. We know this. Now my question is very, very simple. Do we show that compassion or don't we? I think we should. I think it says a hell of a lot about us whether or not we choose to show compassion or choose not to show compassion. We are civilised people. We are supposed to be civilised people. One of the things I have always loved about this country is its attitude to animals. And that, as I have said, is going into reverse. It's a moral imperative for us to set an example, a moral imperative. I remember, you, some of you may know, know, uh, know of Dr. Noel Fitzpatrick, Professor Noel Fitzpatrick. He's one of the most well-known veterinary surgeons in the country. He's got his own program on BBC, in fact. 
I've heard him say many, many times when an animal is in front of him that the moral imperative is to reduce the suffering or to end the suffering. We have laws in this country. People are charged and convicted of criminal offence of causing unnecessary suffering. And yet, while police will go out and arrest people for causing unnecessary suffering in the in this case of a dog or a cat, for example, we allow this. We allow hundreds of thousands of animals to be slaughtered every year, fully conscious. While people who are sadistic people, who are enjoying themselves, by the way, hack at their necks while they're fully conscious. A few of these so-called people have actually been prosecuted at a halal abattoir. A few of those medieval brutes were actually taken to court. They walked out without any punishment. But the response from the government was, and this is ingenious, wait for it, install CCTV in abattoirs. Now, how do you think they knew about this case in order to bring charges? They were secretly filmed, but I think it was Animal Aid which puts secret cameras into abattoirs and has been doing so for years. They were secretly filmed, chanting, dancing, while hacking at the neck of a sheep. They weren't punished, and the response was, let's put CCTV in abattoirs. Does everyone see where I'm going with this? They already had them on film and did nothing. So what good is CCTV going to do? This again is political trickery. It is the let's look like we're doing something while doing nothing at all, which is, seems to be the only thing our government or parliament has got any competence in doing. Looking like they're doing something while doing nothing at all. They are experts at it. And nowhere better than in this, in their shambolic and morally repugnant response to these issues. I want us to change our direction. I want us as a country to change our direction. I want us to set an example. I want us to say, no, we will not have this in our country. Someone said to me recently, but if you ban halal and kosher, it'll just be imported. Well, ideally, we wouldn't import it either. But I do understand that I can't change the world. If I could stand here and come up with a solution, a way to end suffering in the world, I would. But I can't. But what we can do, what we can do, and I say this again as well to those who insist that the only way to end animal suffering is to stop eating meat. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. It's not. I admire the vegans. If this is what they want to do, let them do it. But it's not going to happen. If I stood here and said no more meat, that would be the end of us. People would not listen. But what we can do, and what we should do, is reduce the suffering as much as we possibly can. That has widespread public support. We should harness it and make those changes. All it will take is a re revocation of the religious exemption. Get rid of it. And we can set an example, and we can also reduce, drastically reduce, the suffering of hundreds of thousands of animals every year. We have it within our power to do that, so we must do it. We have that choice to make. Do we show compassion or don't we? Yes, we do. And my response to the religions and the religious lobbies, which have so much power over the politicians. David Cameron has said he has no problem with halal. This was the last, I don't think Theresa May has ever been asked. But it came up during the coalition government, and both Cameron and uh, Clegg, I've got his name for a minute, both Cameron and Clegg said, no, they were fine with it. They're absolutely fine with it. UKIP have gone from we will not ban halal to we will ban halal. I don't know whether it will go back to we will not ban halal again. But I am very, very, very clear. I am, and I think I am one of millions, when I say I am tired, tired of religion overriding the law, and in particular Islam overriding the law. You said earlier um, that uh, hunting 
was the only piece of legislation to be completely ignored. Um, I'm not sure I'd agree, because female genital mutilation, for example, was outlawed in the 80s, and, and it was completely ignored. Um, we have laws all over the place completely ignored. We're not supposed to be, we're not supposed to be gang raping children in the streets either, uh, but that's still going on. We're not supposed to be forcefully marrying little girls to old men, that's going on. And it's all going on for one reason, and that's Islam. And I, for one, have a message on that. Your religion needs to change. If I am standing here asking, imploring for compassion for living creatures, and your religion won't accept that, then who is the problem here? Me or your religion? Your religion is calling for blood. I am calling for compassion. I think compassion should win. It will win if we stand firm and we absolutely demand it. But I will never accept the arguments for all the myths for, the, for unstunned slaughter. So before I finish, one thing. Next time you hear halal meat is stunned, no, it is not. The Halal Food Authority itself acknowledges it is not, the animal is not stunned. It is merely added, its suffering is increased by electric shocks to its brain, which do not render it insensible, but simply disorientated. And the other one, the other myth, they don't suffer any more than, than, than if they are stunned. I mean, come on, come on, it's absurd. The only reason we have halal or kosher slaughter in this country is because we are led by moral cowards. Cowards who will not dare to represent the decent majority in this country and tell the Islamic lobby and the Jewish lobby for that matter that the one, what needs to change here is not us, what needs to change here is them. And I will insist on that and I will stand by it for as long as I am, for as long as I'm standing at a microphone, I don't know how long that will be, probably a very long time. But for as long as I'm leader of this party, I will never, ever compromise on that. Bloodthirsty religions need to change. We don't. Thank you very much.